Uh, thank you for joining us for Open Source Hacker versus Government Lawyer, Clashing Views on Fixing Tech in the DoD. Uh, my name is Eddie, and I am an open source hacker. And uh, I'm Rebecca Lively. I'm a government. I'm a government attorney. <laughs> we met at the Bravo 11 Collaborative Software Development Event. Or I'm I'm told that that's actually Bravo 3, which is some sort of like weird hacker code. It's it's bi binary. Oh, oh, oh. It's binary. Okay, so anyway, we met at this like science fair where a bunch of like software developers got together and like the dude running it, he had some sort of like compromising material, I think, on like the general counsel because he was able to convince all of these completely uncleared random civilians, like he was able to convince his general counsel that it was fine to bring them onto a military base and give them access to like some of the most sensitive government data. Um, and so that's where I met this random civilian. Um, it, it was it was a hackathon, Rebecca, and I think Stuart's here somewhere. Hey. <laughs> so that's awkward. <laughs> but anyway, so we were at this collaborative software development event, and like these, we, we basically because there were these random, uncleared, unvetted people, we had to have like a special environment set up so that they couldn't screw anything up. Um, but good news, we had like literally everything y'all needed. So. You showed up. And yeah, about that. It was my first time on a military base, and I had no idea what to expect. Uh, I showed up with my laptop, and uh, they told me I couldn't bring it in. Of course you could not bring that in. Like, why did you think that you could bring that in? Well, I said, okay, let me just get my little USB YubiKey out so I can log into GitHub. We do not do USBs in the Department of Defense. That is not a thing. And also, GitHub, is that where the open source software is stored? Yep. Okay, yeah, that's also not going to be a thing. Well, there was no internet, so it actually didn't matter. Correct. There was no internet because you were there to exfiltrate. I mean, you could have been there to exfiltrate data, and there would have been no way of knowing that. Yeah, well, you built this environment that... It was a great environment. It had literally all of the tools that developers need to do their jobs. They, they had VS Code installed without any of the language plugins. And, and to be clear, I'm not sure why you would need language plugins. This is America and we speak English. Well, what wound up happening was uh, we kind of went out to the car and tethered from our phones to... Uh, get anything done at all so I, I don't know if you know that is both probably illegal definitely unethical and a very bad security practice well you shouldn't have brought us there if you didn't want us to get things done i didn't actually care if you got anything done well it was a good time anyway time out we don't actually hate each other uh if you couldn't tell i mean we do now uh, well rebecca is dressed stereotypically like chat gpt thinks all women lawyers look like i i was anyway until seconds ago <laughs> Uh, but uh, Stuart and his team did a great job when they put on the Bravo uh, 3 hackathon, so shout out to them. If you ever get a chance to check out the Bravo hackathons, they're rad. They invite civilians and U.S. citizens to come work with controlled and classified data. Really cool time. So they're, they're open to the, to the U.S. public. And, so, oh, go ahead. Oh, one more thing about the Bravo hackathon. It is literally the basis for this entire talk because that is actually where we met. And he was actually having no prior government experience, and he kept asking me questions like, why the fuck are we doing this, Rebecca? And then I would provide the most reasonable explanation that I could imagine based on 13 years of Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> so re rewinding real quick, I'm Eddie Zaneski. I'm an open source uh, staff engineer at a company called Defense Unicorns. Uh, I'm a maintainer for the Kubernetes project, which is what I spend most of my time working on. And I don't go here. I'm not a security person at all. I'm just an open source maintainer. And I definitely am very new to the, the government and the policy world. So uh, I'm about eight months into that world. And I'm Rebecca. Uh, I was actually a government attorney. I am still, when, every time I tell people I'm not an attorney anymore, they think I got disbarred and that did not happen. Uh, but I did stop practicing law about four years ago. Um, and I went to, for three years, uh, the coolest squadron in the entire Air Force, the 90th Cyber Ops Squadron, and built malware, um, which was really freaking cool. And then I escaped there, too, because apparently all good things must end. Uh, and I also joined the same company that Eddie's at, which is Defense Unicorns. Yeah, so we mentioned Defense Unicorns. We don't want to shill or plug too much, but we build open source software for the U.S. military. It's kind of rad. And uh, their goal is to kind of get people like me out of industry and private sector to come work on stuff for the public. So uh, check out what they're doing. They're pretty cool. Uh, we want to quickly define that when we talk about the term hacker here, we're talking about the traditional sense of the word. Again, I'm not a security person. Uh, building cool shit subverting the rules, doing that type of stuff. So that's our definition here. 
And so basically we organized this talk around like six questions that Eddie asked me over the last three months, all of which at the moment I was like, what do you mean you don't understand why that would happen? Uh, and, and actually spurred like really great conversations. Uh, but what I, we kind of realized is that the, the root of all of it is just competing priorities within like the hacker community and the government community. So we're gonna start with what those competing priorities are. Uh, in the government, and I put at the bottom, both because I'm a recovering attorney and because I thought it was funny, terms and conditions apply. Uh, the government, it turns out, is not a monolith that acts completely deliberately and with one singular direction and intention. Um, and so how exactly these various things are rated in terms of importance to any given piece of the federal government depends. Uh, but we've got compliance, so that is like the checking the box and validating that you meet all of the various requirements from all of the various different parts of government and law. There's scale. So literally every time I had a great idea when I worked in the government, no matter how like, hey, I just want to try this and see if it works. Like, can we just string a couple of raspberry pies together and try this thing? The first question I would almost always get from my leadership was, okay, but do you think that would scale across the entire department of the Air Force? And I'm like, really? Like, I just, I want $32 to know whether or not this would work. Like, can I do that? And often like entire projects would be killed because I couldn't articulate a, like couldn't quickly articulate an easy idea of how this would scale or whether it would make sense for it to scale. And that wasn't just tech, that was also policy. So I was like, hey, it'd be cool if for these 16 people we could try this special authority that actually already exists. So they'd be like, yeah, it'd be really unfair to the other people. So scale is a big thing. Documentation, the ability to prove to each echelon of authority that you have done all of the things that you're supposed to do is often, to be completely honest, more important than anything else to the bureaucratic assholes in the government, of which they are not all. Um, fairness, that's both in the acquisition process, but then in general, like making sure, and a lot of that comes from, look, I don't want to be a country where like, if I, as a contractor, install a pool in your backyard, I'm going to get the next contract. Like that is not how I want our country to operate as a taxpayer. So there's a lot that's baked into avoiding like graft and like bad things and crime and stuff. Uh, and the last one is mission. And I put it last because honestly, a lot of times when I was in the government, it felt like it was last. Uh, it felt like it was the last thing in the level of importance. Um, but it is the most important thing to me and I think to a lot of the people in the government, which is the other piece I'd love to touch on really quick, which is this idea of like the stereotypical government employee. So if you, if you are not a government employee and you're in this room, you may have some idea of like a suit wearing like kind of stodgy person who doesn't understand that 11 is actually three in binary. And like that is, in my experience, um, a really unhelpful stereotype for actually getting things done. The other part is the mission, like national security. That sounds boring. Exactly, except for it's not because I run my mouth like nonstop all the time. I talk so much shit and I complain about the government and I haven't gotten shot yet. And that is because of national security, because we have freedom of speech, because we have rights that like, actually it turns out like matter and we are willing to defend. So that's the government. <laughs> so the hacker side of this, obviously as a engineer coming in to solve a problem, a technical problem, uh, the first thing I would care about is, is there technology out there and does it work, right? Is there something that someone built ahead of me that I can use, repurpose? Uh, as an open source maintainer, obviously I, I wish there to be an open source solution. We all know the value of open source so I can audit the code myself, make changes, that sort of stuff. Uh, but I'm not a zealot when it comes to open source, so if there is a good prior, uh, proprietary uh, solution out there, I'm willing to pay for it to make the job better. Uh, does it need to scale is a great question. Uh, it's a lot of engineers when they're first going to build an architect systems, they're worried about uh, reaching Google scale of hundreds of thousands of requests per second, right? Uh, I have a great friend who works for this, uh, the US Forest Department and he builds an app that the uh, firefighting pilots use to fight forest fires and dispatch uh, planes. And he's got three users for his app and it is massively important to, to the national health, right? But it does not need to scale to a massive audience. Uh, and then obviously I wanna iterate quickly and, and over and over again, right? I don't wanna stick to a traditional waterfall model where I'm talking about requirements and shipping stuff very slowly. I wanna like throw shit at the wall and see if it's the right thing to solve the problem and get feedback real quickly. So basically, as I listened to Eddie's naive questions and then answered them and realized they were actually profound, we figured there were three main categories of questions that he asked, and so these are kind of how we organized our talk. The first one is technical challenges in the government. Uh, if you heard if you heard General Nakasone speak this morning, I was so delighted that he talked about Buckshot Yankee because I was like, I have a slide for that. So technical challenges in the government. 
we're specifically talking about like the actual technical challenges, like things that make you you use you said this better than me. What are we talking about? Yeah, this is how uh, the actual technology that we solve problems for. So uh, the, the, what goes into using and choosing that technology? Uh, so one of the first things I noticed at this Bravo hackathon we went to was my partner for the hackathon uh, worked in a secure facility normally. This was kind of his normal environment. And he kept getting up and leaving and coming back. And he had this like notebook with him. Turns out what he was doing was he was going out to the parking lot, looking shit up on Stack Overflow, copying code out of Stack Overflow into his notebook to bring back into the secure room to type it into the editor to see if it worked or not. And that was mind blowing to me that this was, and it, it, it sure, like we were making do with what we had, but this was a normal thing for him to do, right? Granted, a lot of those facilities do have internet pipes and separate computers that you can use, uh, but from what he was telling me, this is his normal everyday thing, and that's mind blowing. It's also super inefficient. One of the questions I asked was actually, so I've worked in a lot of secure facilities where they take all of the fun things that you have and like make you do actual work because you can't play Candy Crush on your phone anymore. Uh, good news, I don't work in that kind of facility anymore, but they'd never taken my key fob before. And so like I was, I, I kind of went down stereotype land and I was like, these people don't understand what it is they're actually screening for. Because my key fob from the rental car company is not dangerous. It does not emit Bluetooth. And I almost told them that they were wrong. And then I decided to shut my mouth because usually when I feel that strongly, it's actually me who's wrong. And then I started thinking like, what could they be worried about? And I realized that the key fob comes from a rental car company. It is assigned to me based on random things like that you could probably Google too or search me on LinkedIn and know what kind of things I'm there for or what kind of things I might be there for. And then at the end of my time, I give it back. And so if you let that into a secure facility, you're potentially letting some sort of battery operated device that's then gonna be returned to somebody else into a facility. So like, again, this is one of those examples of things that seem completely asinine that might actually have legitimate reasons. Uh, but when I think of like the, the root cause of tech challenges in the government, the first one is people like we often lack true technical talent on the keyboard in the government when we're successful at recruiting them we are not successful at retaining them largely because what happens is we promote them out of their technical competence areas uh, people don't like that if you're really good at tech it definitely doesn't mean that you want to lead a thousand people and that like you'll also be good at that uh, the next is law policy and inertia so law specifically like there's all sorts of laws out there they're implemented by policy if you are at a organization at the bottom of the, the organizational chart, then you have potentially like 10 layers of policy between you and the law. And it turns out usually most of them get more restrictive, not less. Um, and then inertia is the last one. So when I was in the legal office, I wanted to buy a fridge with government money for $1,000. I thought it was a reasonable purchase. I looked up the rules and I determined that yes, we could buy a fridge. And so I went to the comptroller and I said, we would like to buy a fridge. Can I have $1,000? And he said, you cannot use government funds to buy kitchen appliances. And I was like, can you help me understand like where you got that from? And he pulled out a binder where he'd printed all of the regulations 10 years previously when he started his job. And he had a thing highlighted in that binder. And sure enough, 10 years ago, you couldn't buy a fridge, but now you can. So like that is the inertia that, that an organization like the government can have. Uh, and the last one is incentives. There are a lot of leaders who say the right things and it feels really good to hear them they don't then also go and align the incentives to prioritize those things. And so if all of these incentives are risk averse and you're saying take risk, fail fast, but also you might get fired if you fail, people aren't going to take risks and fail fast. Yeah, and so some of the things that I noticed coming into this world, uh, anyone familiar with ATOs, this concept of authority to operate, anytime you want to sell, build, or use software to the US government or, or inside the government, you have to do this ATO process. It's basically a sense like hundreds of pages of, of NIST controls and how you implement them. And there's an authorizing official who's responsible, and I mean responsible, for signing off on that. So what that means is that you have sometimes non-technical people that have to make a decision about if the right technology is being proposed for a job. Uh, and it, it kind of leads to this really painful process that uh, some people don't want to take on the risk because they don't understand the, the, the technology that's being proposed. Uh, another thing is there's lots of checkboxes all throughout the government that I've noticed. A big one is software bill of materials or SBOMs. FedRAMP requires that you provide an SBOM to the, the government if you're selling them software. Uh, the reality is that you can provide them a blank SBOM.json file or a handwritten Microsoft Word file and it will check the box. And it's not a problem, it's not like the fault of the, the servicemen who's responsible for checking that box, they're doing what they were trained to do. It's just that that is a requirement and that's kind of where the technical requirement stops. 
uh, legacy and proprietary software, uh, the, you don't even know where to begin to unwind and upgrade some of these systems. It's, it's, that's how complicated it is. Uh, and then I mentioned these NIST controls, uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages of NIST controls uh, that, you know, it, you, you, you don't want to have to write and think through these controls by hand and explain how your application implements NIST 300, 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever. Uh, and it, it gets real frustrating when you were brought on to write code and not, not documentation like this. So how do we fix it? Uh, first one is prioritizing technical depth. Uh, there, is, there is a world where you can have no technical skills whatsoever and promote and promote and promote and be the technically best in the world at something and literally not get promoted within the government because you don't meet whatever leadership criteria or whatever other things that they think that you need. Yeah, and the other part of this I've, I've learned is that there is no actual career track to being a software engineer in the military and that frustrates lots of people from what I've heard. Uh, next is improving hiring and firing speed. It turns out uh, it's hard to fire people in the federal government. Um, and that makes people really uncomfortable about hiring people because you want to make sure that you don't get the wrong person and they get stuck with them for the rest of time. Um, there are things that can be done both within existing law and policy, but also by potentially modifying some existing law and policy to make both of those processes faster. And I think it is essential to compete for tech because I have not met a single outstanding like software developer type who's like really comfortable with the idea of waiting six to eight months for their final job offer. Oh, and I'm supposed to do the next one too. Aligning incentives to priorities, that just comes back to like, look, if you say that failing fast and iterating and all of those things is important, then you need to also make that like what gets you promoted, not something that is a risk that you take that actually affects your career. Yeah, and in automating a lot of that compliance documentation, we need to find ways to produce that with, with policy code, with like actual software policy, where people aren't sit sitting there reading NIST manuals forever and then having to write up their implementation by hand every time. Super frustrating, so we need to find ways to automate that. Uh, budget and organizational inefficiencies, uh, we kind of think about this as the money and the people side of it. And this is a lovely org chart of DOD stuff. This is, this is an, an org chart of DOD cyber, um, and it's, it, it illustrates why I think it's so effective. So one of the things I learned is I went to an Air Force conference, and the Air Force PKI uh, office had a table there in the vendor hall. And I quickly learned that every single branch of the DOD has their own PKI audit, I mean, a, a login, authentication, DNS. They're providing all of these things, and they're not building them themselves. A contractor is building that. So some contractor is getting paid to build the same thing six times, the same way to solve the same requirements from scratch. And as a taxpayer, that's frustrating. Uh, I always thought that this was all provided at the DOD service level and everyone used this like any other sort of like business due to organization out there. Uh, the next one is, so everyone I know who's left the government um, has a handful of stories that they will tell when someone asks them like, what was your moment when you decided that it was time for you to leave the government? Um, I, have, I have a few and this is one of mine. Uh, and, and essentially, I like how you're looking at me right now because you know this story. Um, essentially, we, tried to do an experiment where we took money that would normally go to an acquisition organization, instead we gave it to an operational organization, and we got $2 million. We met the customer requirement in six months instead of a year, and we spent only $500,000 instead of $2 million. And I was super stoked about this. I thought we had made, I thought it was like, a, like a, 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 an unmitigated success. And so we get, and we're talking about, like we're, we're, we're trying to use this as an example, and the acquisition people got to talk first, and they said, yeah, that, that experiment was a total failure. And I was, my face did this thing in the meeting where like it made everyone kind of look at me because apparently it was a facial expression that you're not supposed to make. And I was like, I, I don't understand, like help me, help me out here. And it was a complete failure because we had not spent all of the money within the timeline expected. And I was pissed. So in case you were wondering, I was pissed. Uh, so what causes it? Um, one of the things I heard, are there any lawyers in the room? Okay, and you don't have to, oh, perfect. You, yeah, you're, you're, the lawyers in the room are afraid, and I understand that, like, don't, don't actually raise your hand. But just listen carefully and let this resonate with you. Um, one of the things that my clients would say to me that made me want to punch them in the face was, I do not look good in orange. Um, basically, Rebecca, don't let me go to jail. And when they meant it earnestly, I did not want to punch them in the face, but often, like, they thought it was funny, and they didn't realize I'd heard it 6,000 times, like, that same day. But it is an interesting concept because there aren't a lot of jobs in the private sector where you can literally go to jail if you do your job wrong, but also in good faith. 
That being said, a lot of people don't go to jail for this sort of stuff, but there are rules. So the Anti-Deficiency Act is a great example. It is a federal law. It is a criminal statute. And it basically says if you accidentally spend money wrong, you go to jail or you could at least, or be fined or like all sorts of other things. So like the, the federal government is full of really scary things that can happen to you if you screw up your job. And also it usually doesn't pay enough to take on that level of risk. Um, not invented here. I think this is a pervasive problem, not just in the government, but also it's definitely a problem in the government. So it's this idea that like, look, I don't, maybe, the, maybe this other organization is doing it so much better. I don't really care. I don't really want to go down that path. We built this. We know what it is. We know how it works. We've been using it for 10 years. Like we're going to keep doing it. Uh, the next one is no one ever asks for less. This is another thing when I was listening to General Nakasone this morning, he was talking about how like, we need more people. We need more funds. We, and I was, I, I felt like he set me up for this. We actually don't necessarily need more, but also no one's ever gonna ask for less. So like when the Congress rolls through, like what can we do to help? Well, we're gonna need more people and more funds. And so we add and we add and we add and the government gets bigger and more complex. Uh, and then the last one is the, the appropriations bills each year are getting passed later and later and later, which means you end up in this situation where the money actually shows up. This is just a weird government thing because money is weird in the government. Like, so the money shows up and you have three months to spend it because you need to spend it three months in advance of the end of the fiscal year. And it's a nightmare from, for so many reasons that you can probably figure out on your own. Uh, time is valuable. Uh, I think we gotta start speed running this. Uh, time is valuable. Uh, yes, we're gonna move on. Uh, it took three months to get a, a, a three month contract signed and started. Uh, that's, that's just the story I have there, it was awful. Uh, tech talent's expensive. It's real hard to get people to go from making a ton of money at a Google or an Amazon and ask them to take a pay cut to come do civil service and work for the, the DOD. Uh, they just can't compete. Uh, selling to the government is absolutely a pain. Uh, you know, there's a lot of requirements that you have to uh, fill out. It's a kind of like a decision you have to make as a company where you're, once you've kind of had a, a bigger adoption from the, you know, the, the consumer world, and you're like, okay, we can turn to the government. And then someone tells you that, oh, you can sell the same thing to the government six different times, and you can make a lot of money doing that, and then you kind of prioritize that, right? Um, so some of the suggestions we have, uh, we want to be able to create incentives for technical experts to join and stay. And the answer there is not necessarily more money. It's, it's probably one of the most trite examples I've heard people say, oh, we can't pay enough, so we're never going to succeed. Especially once you've successfully recruited someone, you're already paying enough. So then there's other ways to get them to stay, and it's not usually money. I'm not saying money doesn't help. And some organizations like CISA, for example, have done incredible things at raising the actual pay for technical contributors. And also the 90s done a great job too. Yeah, this um, use it or lose it financial policy is really frustrating to hear that if you don't spend all of your money, you don't get the same amount or more next year. So you're incentivized to just blow money towards the end of the year so you can say, oh, we spent it all, we need more money next year. And, and that's ridiculous. And that's not just a thing for the government, that happens in corporate too, but those are policies that absolutely do not lead to the right incentives. Uh, the next one is delete, delete, delete. So that the idea of as you are creating more things, you also need to be uncreating other things. If you set up a task force to make sure that all of the asbestos was out of the building, you don't need to keep the task force when the asbestos is out of the building. Yeah, and then prioritize quality over quantity. Um, one staff engineer can't be replaced with 10 en junior engineers. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way, right? You need to bring in technical talent and expertise uh, from a leadership level and keep those folks around. Uh, and you need to prioritize having that quality. All right, so the next one, private partner, pri Private partnerships are challenging. Public-private partnerships are challenging. There we go. So uh, we were at this conference, and this colonel I was talking to, he said he led some research and training facility for the Air Force and how they, they taught people how to come in and learn how to code and use uh, Kubernetes and some other modern stuff. And you know, my face lit up. I'm like, cool, I'd love to come talk it to your students and you know, teach them about some of the cool stuff we're working in Kubernetes. And the guy stonewalled me and didn't want to talk to me because he thought I was trying to sell him services and stuff. And I was just genuinely excited as a, as a lead for an open source project to come talk about the cool things that we were building. Uh, and so once Rebecca actually explained that to him, his whole demeanor changed and he was much more open to a conversation. Uh this one's funny. So if you've ever worked in the government, you show up to a conference and you ask for your landing fee because you're going to need to have snacks and somebody went and bought those. Um, so we, we get to the Bravo hackathon and we're asked for a landing fee and Eddie says, what the fuck is a landing fee? And I'm like, well, it's for the snacks. And like to me again, this is one of those things that's so obvious. He's like, well, why didn't someone just go buy the snacks? I'm like, well, somebody did, we've got to pay them back. And so then he says, well, can't Defense Unicorns, our company just sponsor them? Like, I can just go swipe my company card and buy some snacks and then we don't have to do this landing fee garbage. And I was like, 
So, so we could, but the paperwork that would be required by the government to accept our donation of snacks would not be worth it. This is simpler, I promise, just pay 20 bucks, have some Cheetos. So what makes it hard? Uh, ethics requirements. That whole thing of like, look, if you look at how Russia and China do business when it comes to contracting, there is a favored set of contractors who get all of the work uh, from food service to, I don't know, running newspapers. And that is not how this country should be. And we don't want it to be. So instead, we put together these really complicated, complex ethics requirements that make it almost impossible to even have lunch with your friend who's a contractor. Um, I'm not saying that's necessarily the right answer either, and there's probably somewhere in between we need to be. They also tend to make people really, really gun shy about things that they're not sure whether or not are an ethical issue. And so they'll just default to like, hey, I'm not going to talk to you, look at you, or ever speak to you again, Rebecca, now that you've left the government, because pretty much you're dead to me. Um, Next is accidentally screwing up active acquisitions. They take a really freaking long time. If you screw it up and start to ha like have to start over, that sucks. And so like you will, if you have an active acquisition in the pipeline, you are not going to speak to anyone about it because you're terrified. And I almost understand that. Uh, the next one, stop trying to sell me stuff. Uh, when I was in the government, I had a email black box um, that as soon as you as a contractor sent me a single email that was anything other than like directly related to current existing work, you went to the black box and I never saw your emails again or thought about you ever. Um, this was not probably the best choice in retrospect, but also like Eddie absolutely would have been in my black box the minute he was like, hey, I want to tell your people about some stuff. Can I come lead a lunch and learn? I'd be like, hell no, and also black box. Um, the last one is just this unwillingness to articulate what it is that you need, this I'll know it when I see it mentality that I've seen in a lot of government employees, which like I'm not going to I'm not going to even collaborate with you on developing a requirement. I'm just going to wait until something comes along and like a beacon of light it inspires me and that's what I'm going to buy. And when I'm trying to decide how to spend internal research and development funds, that is not going to be an effective mechanism for prioritizing them. Yeah. Um as an open source lead, we have different foundations. We have so many working groups with empty seats at the table and government folks, we want you to come join us. Uh, we don't know how to reach out to you. We don't know how to invite you to these working groups, but there's too many empty seats that we need filled from people in the public sector. Uh, we can't solve your problems if we don't know about them. Someone told me the other day, I work on kubectl, a command line tool for Kubernetes, and they said, if you made this one small change, it would make my day-to-day -day life a hundred times better. And I was like, cool, let's go fix that right now. And their mind was blown that that was just something like, like you can file these feature requests. This is something you're allowed to do, but we don't know that what your priorities are and we can't prioritize this work unless you tell us. Um, there's a, this stigma in the open source community too that a lot of folks that are building open source software don't want their software used by the military. Uh, it's kind of a double-edged sword. That's the beauty of the open source is open source allows anyone to take, modify, and use that software. Uh, so it's it's kind of a balance we need to work through. Um, but it's, you know, the, the idea that this software is open source, we don't want certain groups to use it. Uh, it, it doesn't meet the spirit of open source. Uh, and I legit just want to help, just like with that kernel, right? A lot of open source maintainers, we're building cool things that we care about and are super passionate about. We really want to help. We don't care about selling you things. Hopefully a lot of us that work on large projects are funded by an employer to do this work in open source. So engage with us, make feature requests. Like that is what we want you to do. How do we fix it? I don't know. I'm done. Just kidding. Um, one of the things actually I love uh, are these no cost agreements called cooperative research and development agreements. They let the government share information and vice versa with academia, industry, and it's a really great opportunity to one, make it clear you're not trying to sell something, you're legit trying to collaborate. Um, but also kind of break down some of the barriers that would make you maybe more resistant to sharing information within the government. Yeah, and one of the things I've learned about this is that there's kind of two steps to building an implementation for a government solution. There's the like design and implement, there's the design phase, the proposal piece, and then there's the implementation piece. And if you do the first one, you're ineligible to bid and do the second one. So obviously there's more money and ongoing support fees in the second one. So most groups want to do that type of work and not the first group. So what you hind up with is people who are technically comp, uh, com competent uh, implementing and building things that might not be designed the best possible way. And, and that's not good either. This is finding ways to engage and learn from industry and the tech community. So if you are in this room, you are doing that because you showed up. Uh, if, if you're a government person in this room anyway, you showed up to DEF CON, so good start. If you are not a government person and you're playing spot the Fed, you have for sure come to the right room and I'm really proud of you. <laughs> Go ahead.
Oh, that's a fair point. Everyone's a Fed. But go ahead, look to your left, look to your right. They're both Feds. Talk to them. Um, and then the last one is talk to Eddie. Don't, don't have just an email black box where you put all contractors and never speak to them. Um, not just Eddie, but people like him. Like, go and talk and engage with those communities. I think there's a lot to be gained from that. Yeah, and I met, we mentioned open source foundations. There's CNCF, uh, Cloud Native Compute Foundation, Open Source Security Foundation. Uh, there's all sorts of working groups in there, like I mentioned before. So come find us, come join with us uh, on a neutral ground. So that means everything is fucked. Or maybe not. Here's the last, our last kind of what you can do to help. Have you ever uh, considered a career in public service? Uh, and this isn't just a meme. Uh, there's ways that you can work in this space without working directly for the government. Uh, like myself, right? I joined a defense contractor to work in open source software. Uh, but th there's, there's other methods like out there, like uh, 18F from GSA is doing a great job to cut the, the hiring speed and kind of like up salary caps for folks. Uh, CISA is also doing a great job in this space to, to, to bring people in from external talent. So uh, it's something that you should absolutely consider for your next job. Uh, the next one is actually like reading uh, law and policy. I used to joke that the only thing I had going for me as an attorney was literacy, um, because there were a tons of times where people were like, oh, you can't do this. And I would literally just open the policy that they were citing and read it, sometimes to them, and they would go, oh, I guess you could do that. And it's like, they could have done that step first without coming to me. Like that did not take a lawyer. So, so read it yourself especially if you're gonna bitch about it, you have a lot more credibility if you've actually read it. And then when you read it, if you identify things that like, look, no kidding, impede your ability to get something done, there are ways to change that um, from within the government and from outside of the government. Specifically from within the government, I was able to change the law five different times before I left the federal government. Um, sometimes surprisingly quickly, other times after literally, literally a decade of bitching about the same thing consistently, like, but it can actually happen. There are ways to do it. It might not be worth it. It might suck. But there's also other foundations that can help you do that, too. Yeah, and if you, if you don't want to take that initiative on your own, work with the EFF, work with the ACLU. There's groups out there that this is what they are designed to do, is do the right thing and fight for the right policy change. And a lot of this space is if we don't get well-designed technical policy in place, some random government contractor or some senator is gonna propose something they have no idea about. So we need to get ahead of, of, of regulating and legislating a lot of this technology. And then the last one is, it kind of goes hand in hand with the others. Like if something seems completely stupid, give it like a hot second before you just assume that everyone involved is completely dumb. And like actually see if you can dig in and see what's driving it. Because if you can identify the reason for a very stupid policy, then maybe you can more articulately, articulately offer something new that meets that underlying intent. Yeah, and you, you have to assume positive intent on a lot of this stuff, right? Like no one is out there to kind of like do bad things that make people's lives terrible in this space. <laughs> I'm naive. Uh, but you, you have to think about that, right? Like it might just be a bad implementation of a good idea originally. Uh, and last but not least, invite government folks to participate in the things that you're doing, invite them to the table, they do exist. Uh, when I went to the army base, I expected to see everyone walking around in fatigues and holding guns and rifles. And I think I saw one gun the entire time I was at the base at the front gate. Uh, and everyone else was just kind of chilling as normal people in a town. So uh, I had a lot of misconceptions that I worked through. And uh, these folks are awesome and super smart. So uh, with that, I think we're definitely out of time. Uh, we'll probably be out in the hallway to answer questions. And oh, I'm getting a four minute warning. Three minute warning. We could probably take one question. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on. Uh, we have an open SSF policy day in DC on September 9th or whatever that Monday is. Uh, we're hoping to do a lot of good out of that. Uh, Ava, if you're in the room, Ava works for CISA, uh, doing some cool policy in that front. Um, I don't see Ava, but yeah, th there's a lot of efforts to, to try and make that better. Um, and especially, like we said, the foundation work, because if we can set up those agreements with the foundation and the DOD, then it no longer becomes a, a place of trying to sell people stuff. It becomes a place of how can we collaborate and like actually make technical decisions that make sense. So. And with that, we really are out of time. Thank you guys so much. We will stand in the hallway. Thank you. <laughs>